everyone and welcome to Space Week Live on this Sunday, October 16th, 2022. Uh, let's get right into it. Let's see. Last Tuesday, NASA gave an update on their, art, on their DART mission analysis. Uh, as we all know, DART made a bullseye um, into the asteroid Dimorphos uh, a few weeks ago, but it remains to be seen how much it, the impact actually affected the orbit of the asteroid. Uh, well, according to their careful measurements since that time, uh, the answer is more than twice what was anticipated. And now, to be fair, uh, the the resulting change in the asteroid's uh, orbital period around its parent, uh, Dimorphos, was within the upper range of the predicted, um, you know, possible, the predicted possible. Uh, uh, whatever magnitude of, of change, but um, uh, it was at the high end, and, and it was much, much higher than average. So they were anticipating approximately a point, a 0 0.6, oh, hello, a 0 0.6 percent change in the orbital period of Dimorphos, and what they got was uh, more than twice that. It was about 1.5 percent. Um, so congratulations. And, um, NASA believes that the, uh, I mean, they have, they have a lot more analysis to do, but they initially, their initial assessment is that the large amount of ejecta from the impact, uh, helped to, um, um, uh, well, basically boost the, the, the efficacy of, of the, of the impact to, to slow down dimorphos. So congratula congratulations, NASA. And additionally, during that same broadcast, the Italian Space Agency released some of their uh, images from their CubeSat, which had deployed from uh, DART prior to uh, uh, some time prior to the impact. Uh, unfortunately, the images that we got to see were kind of potato cam, but uh, Nonetheless, it provided a an external view uh, from pretty close, uh, pretty close by of the impact as it happened. Um, yeah, so this is a trail of debris uh, 
behind Dimorphos that was uh, ejected by the uh, by the impact. Also on Tuesday, the Japanese Space Agency. Oh, I don't have this queued up to the launch. All right. The Japanese space agency JAXA launched an Epsilon rocket with a bunch of tech demos on board. So, uh, you know what? I am sleep deprived and um, a little out of it right now. So I apologize for not actually showing the images from uh, Dimorphos. Let's rewind. Okay, so here we have, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. This might also be from Hubble. Yeah, and this is an example of, of an image that we got from the Italian Space Agency's uh, CubeSat flying by Dimorphos. So the large blob in the upper right is uh, Didymos. The small blob at the bottom center is Dimorphos. And you can see the cone of debris flying away from Dimorphos uh, to the left. So not too bad. And there's Giorgio Sacuccia. All right, moving on. Um, let me restart this segment because I totally screwed up on my uh, my uh, picks and picks there. Also on Tuesday, the Japanese space agency JAXA launched an Epsilon rocket with a bunch of tech demos on board. We have a go for pyrotechnics arming. OBC sequence timer start. Initiating the onboard computer sequencer. Activating thermal batteries. SMS jetenka. Third mode site ignition. Lift off. First stage mode ignition and lift off. 8、革新的衛星技術実装3号機、QPSR3、QPSR4搭載したイプシロンロケット6号機は2022年10月12日午前9時50分43秒にいつの裏宇宙空間監視。So that aggressive pitch over uh right after liftoff is typical for this rocket. It's a little bit scary looking because it uh it's um a much more aggressive pitch over than we're accustomed to seeing, but Number one, this is a small rocket, and number two, it has a uh, solid propellant, kind of like a Vega or or a ballistic missile, uh, in which case, uh, which has a very high thrust to weight ratio. Um, now, this was Epsilon's sixth launch. Uh, there hadn't been any mishaps previously. Unfortunately, this time, the rocket experienced a malfunction of some sort after the second stage shutdown, which wasn't wasn't entirely clear during the broadcast, or it might have been if I spoke Japanese, but uh, but um, um, at least with what little translations they they did provide, I was I was uh, unaware at the time that there was a problem. But indeed, there was a problem, and ground controllers engaged the flight termination system uh, once they determined that the payload was not going to make it to orbit, and so those. Uh, Technology demonstrations were lost, unfortunately. On Wednesday, a Russian Proton M launched Angosat 2 for the country of Angola from Baikonur Cosmodrome.
ракета носителя устойчивая. Always nice to see proton launches. And do, 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 do. we have another one that's not queued up. Also on Wednesday, a Chinese Long March 2C launched from Taiyuan with Huangjing 205, also known as SSAR-01, a satellite designed to collect 5-meter resolution S-band radar image data. On Friday, Expedition 67 crew members, uh, Italian astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, Kjell Lindgren, Bob Hines, and Jessica Watkins returned to Earth after six months on the ISS in their Crew Dragon Freedom spacecraft, concluding SpaceX's fourth commercial crew mission. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, all books open. And Dragon separation confirmed. All 12 hooks now open. Hooks all open and release confirmed at 11.05 a.m. Central Time while Dragon and the International Space Station flew 259 statute miles above the North Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> A little sped up for pacing. As uh, stuff in space usually happens uh, rather slowly, even if they're traveling at uh, very fast speeds. Now... Uh, they undocked from the Node 2 Zenith, or space-facing port, away from the Earth, so they got some great views of the ISS with the Earth below. If we skip forward, here we go. And Freedom SpaceX on the big loop to Heartburn Zero was nominal. Four astronauts' time aboard the orbit outpost is complete following a six-month science and research mission. Undocking occurred at 11.05 a.m. Central Time. You can see uh, one of the astronauts there taking photos with his uh, iPad through the uh, viewport. Thanks, Lisa. I just want to point out that awesome view that we have that we had moments ago. There it is. That is a view from Dragon as it leaves the International Space Station. So it's incredible that it was just there moments ago, <laughs> and it's moving already, as we can see, further and further away. And they were docked to the node to... And here is a view from an infrared camera aboard, aboard a NASA plane of, the, of Crew Dragon's re-entry. We have about two minutes remaining in the anticipated period of uh, communications blackout. Now, it's not an exact science. There might be some variation that occurs. Uh, we might hear from the crew a little earlier the, than we expected or potentially a little bit later. Um, but we are all on the edge of our seats, eagerly awaiting um, to hear from the crew. So far, everything looking good. And parachute deployment. And there's those drug shoots, and you can hear the crowd here very excited to see them deploy. So if you're not already familiar, the process of, of uh, or the sequence of parachute deployments is that first they release two drogue chutes, which are these small parachutes, which slow the craft down to the point where it is safe to deploy the four main parachutes. We are just anticipating the main chutes to deploy here shortly. And the, uh, the main chutes, when they are initially deployed, are, are furled or 
uh, what do they call it? I forgot the term, but um, they are uh, uh, bunched up and then they gradually are released to a wider diameter as the vehicle slows down so as to uh, uh, minimize the stresses on the parachutes, which are, after all, fabric, albeit very tough fabric. And from this point, it takes a um, couple of minutes to complete its descent down to the ocean where we get splashed down. to splash down after spending 170 days in space after launching on April 27th. It was a success. Now, let me adjust volume here on the fly. Uh, once the once the recovery crew finishes hooking up the capsule uh, to the hoist on the recovery ship, the last man climbs the soggy spacecraft and leaps into the water. I'm not seeing them. They might be just off the screen. Now, it took a little over 10 minutes for the recovery crew to complete their safety checks. And once they did complete... Tally-ho! Uh, now, I call them frogmen, though technically that word refers to combat-trained military divers. But um, I'll still call them frogmen because um, it amuses me and I can't think of a better term. <laughs> and it's, it's more interesting than uh, recovery crew or, or whatever, SpaceX diver. Finally, the crew emerges from Crew Dragon. Screen there, that is all part of our standard procedures. Looks like we're getting some claps and cheers for Bob Hines. First out of Crew Dragon Freedom. <laughs> So upon uh, extracting the crew in either in uh, Kazakhstan or off the coast of Florida, uh, they always place the crew on uh, in chairs or, or on stretchers, whatever. Um, not usually on stretchers, but in chairs in any case. Because uh, despite the fact that they work out for more than two hours every day up there in space, they have still suffered from much muscle atrophy, bone density loss, and they don't have their land legs back. Uh, it would be interesting. I, I'm pretty sure I have seen astronauts come out of the capsule and just stand up and walk around, but uh, most of the time they do sit down because it's been half of, half a year since they've experienced the pull of gravity. Um, now, there is, of course, gravity up there on the ISS. There's about a 90% of the gravity that we experience here on the surface. However, uh, they don't feel it because they are in orbit. They're in constant free fall. And so it's, it's uh, not so much um, zero gravity per se as weightlessness that they experience up there because there's always gravity. Also on Friday, a Long March 2D launched from Xichang with the Yaogan 36 satellite. Lastly, in the wee hours of Saturday, a SpaceX Falcon 9 launched from uh, the Hotbird 13F geostationary television broadcast satellite for Utilsat. 
two minutes, 15 seconds. Two minus 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Engines full power and ignition. Lift off the top of nine. Go, Hopper, go. And the landing. MVAC shut down. All right, we started to see that that MVAC nozzle was losing that bright white glow, indicating we had a second Stage second one engine, landing burn. Second engine cutoff, and there on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that the first stage has begun the landing burn. Nominal parking orbit. Heard good orbital insertion there for the second stage. Stage one landing leg deploy. Stage one landing confirmed. And there you have it. That landing marks SpaceX's 147th recovery of an orbital class rocket, including first stage landings for... And finally, satellite deployment into a geosynchronous transfer orbit for Hotbird 13F. Payload separation confirmed for the Hotbird 13F payload. And with confirmation of successful payload deploy, we'll, we'll go ahead and end our launch webcast for tonight. All of us here at SpaceX want to give a big thank you to our customer, Utelsat, for entrusting us with today's mission. We also want to give a shout out to the range and federal aviation... Very nice deployment uh, images there. All right. So, that about wraps it up for last week. Now, looking further back into space history... This Tuesday, October 18th, will mark the third anniversary of the first all-female spacewalk by astronauts Christina Koch and Jessica Meir back in 2019. So looking ahead to this week, on Tuesday, October 18th, at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC, is a Soyuz 2.1V launch of MKA number 1, 2, and 3. Now, Soyuz 2.1V is a variant of the Soyuz that has no uh, SRBs. So you know those iconic four, those four iconic solid rocket boosters on the side of Soyuz that, uh, um, that uh, come off and form the Korolev cross as it ascends. Well, this is just the the core stage. There's no side boosters. Um, and there will not be live coverage of that launch because it is a uh, classified military type launch. On Thursday, October 20th at 10.45 a.m. Eastern, 14.45 UTC, is a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch with Starlink 436 from Cape Canaveral. Then on Saturday, October 22nd, at 2.37 p.m. Eastern, 1837 UTC, is an Indian launch on a GSLV Mark III of um, 36 OneWeb satellites. This is OneWeb 14. Now, this launch was significantly delayed because um, these satellites, I don't know if it's these specific satellites, but a batch of OneWeb satellites, possibly these, were physically on a Soyuz rocket and awaiting launch when the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine took place earlier this year. And uh, Roscosmos at that time decided that they were not going to launch the OneWeb satellites. And they um, covered up all of the flags on the rocket except for the Indian flag. And... Um, uh, and they, they rolled the rocket back for la from the launch pad and they canceled the launch. And so OneWeb had to figure out who else to use for their launch services, uh, Russia being no longer an option. 
But uh, now the OneWebs are back on board a rocket and they await their launch this Saturday. Uh, so that is it for this week. I want to take a moment to thank our channel supporters. Um, those of you who have stuck with us through thick and thin and uh, invite you to um, express your support however you feel is appropriate. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, all right, let's get to your questions. Okay, yeah, I apologize for the for the the rough start to the stream. I am I really am sleep deprived, and uh, uh, I tried to take a nap before the show, but that then prevented me from you know it, it sucked away an hour of of prime prep preparation time to get all my all my clips and and details uh, in order. All right, Julian Roberts, Raw Space. Where's Lucy in the sky, and does she have diamonds? Um, I did see something in the news about the Lucy mission this week. I have not read it, so I don't have any update on that. Um, uh, as for diamonds, only in our minds, I guess. <laughs> only in our in our uh, preferred music players. But sorry, I don't have an update on Lucy. Um, if there's news, I'll, I'll cover it next week. Mark Desaire, uh, how long has Proton been in use now? The Proton rocket. Now, Proton, the atomic, uh, the atomic particle, has been in use since, since the, uh, the Big Bang. But Proton, the rocket, uh, was first launched in... Wow, that white screen really lights up my, uh, my face. Let me darken it up there. Uh, Proton, the rocket, has been in use since 1965. Um, so, yeah, it's been around a long time. But you know what? Uh, the, the rocket fuels and the basic uh, components of rocketry that were in use back then still apply today. That We're, we're all subject to the same laws of physics. So, um, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, they have modernized the system. But, um, you know, with modern avionics and, and hydraulics and whatever else. But uh, all right. So other questions. Mark Desaire, the Long March has also had many versions. Uh, yeah, it has, but I think that's kind of that they're kind of cheating, like because they call almost every rocket a long march. It's like if if the United States called, you know, called every rocket a freedom rocket. So it's just the freedom A, it's the freedom B, it's the freedom 12 C, you know. Um, so so most Chinese rockets are long march rockets, but they're not they're not the same rocket by any stretch like they're. You know, some of them are hypergolic. Some of them are are um, uh, use RP one. Some of them use solid propellant. You know, they have different uh, different sizes and different characteristics, different fuels, and um, some of them launch from vehicles, some from ocean barges, and some from land. So, uh, you know, the fact that they use the same name for all of them. Doesn't really make them the same rocket. Uh, the Cheesy Princess says, Did you hear about the Skyrora rocket that crashed? Scottish company. And as I'm Scottish, I feel a bit sad that the first launch failed. Um, I haven't heard any news about a Scottish rocket that crashed. Um, though I can say that it is not surprising that the first launch failed. Most first launches do fail. Um, I don't know about that. I don't have the statistics on that, but but a great deal of of early and first launches do fail. Uh, rocket development is not easy, and um, uh, you know because particularly because um, uh, what a rocket is basically is a controlled explosion. You have you have the combustion of um, a highly energetic fuel and that has to be you know directed out the nozzle in a very controlled fashion 
um, if anything at all goes wrong, you know, in your staging or in your combustion chamber or in your whatever, uh, there's a, a thousand ways that, it, that, that a launch can go wrong. And they say there's only one that can, in which it can go right. But I mean, there is some wiggle room there depending on the robustness and redundancy of your system. But, uh, but nonetheless, rocket science is, is hard stuff. Um, you know, additionally, when you're launching, uh, you control your ascent trajectory using, um, you know, gimbaling and, um, uh, other such things. You're not, you don't have aerodynamic control, uh, as you would say with an aircraft where you have fins that make you go, you know, or flaps that make you, uh, turn left or, or turn right. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's an old industry now. I mean, uh, rockets have been around for almost as long as, as planes really, but, um, but, uh, nonetheless, it's, it's, uh, difficult stuff. All right. Uh, Kibervatniki, if I pronounced that right asks, why is Starship being developed for so long? They promised to send the first ships to Mars in 2022. Well, any, uh, first of all, any promises to, like any deadlines that are placed on sending anything to Mars are purely optimistic guesswork. Um, nobody knows when we're going to be able to get to Mars. And there's a whole lot of space, uh, you know, at least 30 million miles, depending on, depending on, uh, the the uh, relative positions of the planets in between here and Mars, and in a home and transfer orbit, it would be much longer than thirty million miles. Um, and there's a lot that goes on in space that we are simply not prepared for. <clears throat> the radiation, uh, in particular, and cosmic rays. Um, we have no like we have no good way to protect against those things once we're outside of. Earth's protective uh, magnetosphere, and uh, like the cut, well, the, the the magnetosphere for ionizing radiation, and Earth's atmosphere for cosmic rays. Now, because cosmic rays are are heavy particles, usually protons, that travel at incredible speeds, relativistic speeds, um, that come at us, stream stream towards us from all over the universe, really. And um, so astronauts in orbit on the ISS experience uh, uh, co uh, cosmic ray exposure, as, do, as does the equipment on the ISS, as well as all satellites. But um, uh, in a Mars mission, they would be subject to not just six months or one year, of cosmic rays, but, um, you know, up to two years, uh, perhaps even longer because of how long it takes to get there. Plus once you get there, uh, you're going to be on the surface of Mars, which is a very thin atmosphere, just like a, a percent, the, the, the density of our own atmosphere. And so, uh, you'd be bombarded by a lot more cosmic rays than you would here on earth where we have a thick atmosphere. Um, as for why Starship development is taking so long, it is a revolutionary uh, spacecraft, the likes of which has never been attempted before. Um, and it, it has some tricks up its sleeve that are brand new. Nobody's ever done anything like this before. I mean, typically, when you have a multi-stage rocket... Sure, you can reuse the first stage. You know, you can either bring it down on parachutes, splash it down in the ocean, or land it on a drone ship like SpaceX does, or or pluck it out of the sky like Rocket Lab is trying to do. But that's the first stage. It re-enters at maybe 3,000 miles an hour. But uh, once you get into orbit, you are going, you know, once you achieve orbit, you're going 17,000 plus miles per hour. And the, the re-entry forces are much, much greater. And so that's why uh, crew capsules such as Apollo and Soyuz 
and Crew Dragon and Starliner from Boeing uh, are all kind of shaped the same because that is, uh, so far as we've been able to calculate, the optimal shape for a crew capsule re-entering the atmosphere. The shape naturally causes the capsule to orient in the correct uh, direction to um, uh, you know, allow the heat shield to uh, mitigate the atmospheric heating from friction and, and plasma generation. So um, uh, now Starship aims to perform a re-entry not with a capsule-shaped crew module, but rather with a giant reusable spaceship uh, slash upper stage of, of the Starship rocket system. And so, um, you know, the, the, uh, I mean, it, it has to be able to deploy payloads. And so, it, you know, it needs some sort of fairing that, that opens and then closes. Um, it, it needs, um, you know, thrust, it needs fuel, it needs all the systems that a rocket would need, but it also needs to come back down through the atmosphere. And so, you know, they've already tested their, um, their mini wings that fold out and uh, their pitch over um, to, to landing. Now the landing is still a bit dicey, but, um, um, but yeah, the, the re-entry, I mean, they, they have heat tiles on the Starship now, but that has yet to be tested because they haven't been able to conduct their orbital test flight yet. Um, now, part of the delay is not SpaceX's fault at all, but uh, it was caused by a lengthy and drawn out process of getting certified to launch from their um, Starbase location in Texas by the Federal Aviation Administration. You know, the FAA environmental assessment took months and, uh, you know, put a big, a big hold on, on, uh, uh, launch attempts. All right. So I saw Chris V asked a question. Did the astronauts that went to the moon say it feels different out of earth's orbit? Uh, I don't specifically recall, but I haven't reviewed like all of the astronaut testimony after the Apollo missions. It would be an interesting thing, an interesting, um, uh, uh, project to dive into though. Um, you know, listening to, the astronaut press conferences and debriefings and whatever, um, to hear, you know, what they had to say once they got back. All right. Any more questions? Okay, so um, that about wraps it up for this week. Thank you all for coming, and um, enjoy your week, and I'll see you next time. Keep it raw.